So this is the Average Joe Strongman Show Special Edition. All right, here we are, special edition uh, number three, I believe. We're going to be talking about warm-ups today. All right, so Mike Loman, Lee Woody, special guest star, Ken McClelland, um, talking about the book Mastering Strongman that will be out in January, talking about all things uh, how to train strongman for master's athlete and why no one including especially masters should not skip their warm up. Oh so yeah. Ken Ken let's talk about why a proper warm up is of critical importance for old fuckers like us. Well, the analogy I always give to my masters athletes is uh we're classic cars, right? Classic classic muscle cars. And when you start those bad boys, you can't just start them and take off like you can a new car, right? You got to let them idle for a while let everything heat up and get warm and start functioning correctly. You know, that's us. When we get older, as we age, you know, connective tissue loses its elasticity, right? Our joints are stiff, things like that. Okay. We need, it, it's, it's smart to take 10 to 15 minutes to warm up your joints, to address, you know, mobility issues, <clears throat> loosen up and, and prime the engine for training. Right do some activation, do some things to, you know, stretch things that are, that are abnormally tight for the day. Like if you sit all day, you know, take a moment, open up the front of your hips, activate your glutes, get your hips right before you go and attempt to deadlift or do certain things because that is going to help prevent injuries. That's going to help, you know, make sure that we come out of that training session better and not injured. Well, and let's be let's be clear, and I'll just be honest here. Like early on when I started training strongman, like I did not warm up properly. My warm up was like some lighter log press or some lighter deadlifts. That was it. And I'll admit that was stupid. I was a fucking idiot. Like I mean, look where it got me, right? Fake hip. How many yeah. bicep tears? I mean, this, that, and the other, right? So you can't just go and do some lighter, you know, pressing or some lighter deadlift, you know, sets and get into it and say that you're warmed up. No. no, well, no. We, all, we all played, uh, you know, sports, high school, college. I mean, sure. it's football, wrestling. You know, you, yeah. you, you understand the, the mentality of, you know, a warm up, right? And back yeah. when we were all in school, it was shortly thereafter, you know, kibosh that stretching was a problem, right? It was actually losing strength. And Ken actually coached me uh, for OSG last year. And, you know, one of the things that I realized in, in warm-ups, and I've always done warm-ups, but like you, Mike, it was warm-up as a couple sets, right, at moderate weight and get the blood pumping and I'm ready to go. Where it totally changed for me with uh, when, Ken, you brought me on to more of the yoga type of stretching and that type of stuff up front. Matter of fact, I think I ended up calling you like a couple weeks into the program, like, dude. What in the hell is going on? Why am I weaker at these, at these, you know, at deadlift and everything else? I'm getting weaker. And he's, and Ken said, it's like, hey, you're now getting elasticity back into those muscles that you never had before. And now I'm way stronger than I ever was, but my warm up hasn't changed. It changed the whole evolution of how I warm up. And, you know, to me, before it was, yeah, I'll get on a bike and pedal for five minutes and then do a couple, you know, preps on the log rep and done. That's my warm up. Where now it's totally different, and it's yeah. I've been an idiot for years. Well, that. let's talk about why that warm up was kicking his ass, Ken. What happens from the time you start to learn that standardized warm up to the you know several weeks later once you've been doing it? Well, two or three things. One, it is work. You know, the glute circuit that I I, I give people like so I give people a series of things. Usually, it's um, some thoracic mobility and some hip mobility, depending on if it's an upper or lower body day. And it's dedicated, like, to that day. Your, you know, your hip mobility on a lower body day is going to be there to open up the hips and loosen up some things. And then we do, you know, uh, like a, a, a glute circuit that I basically stole from uh, Pilates, right, that basically warms up the hips in a couple different directions, 
right? And so then those are warm. And then we go into a little bit of activation, either some jumps or some throws. And then we go into our workout. And part of what I found, especially so part of what what, what Lee was dealing with, was because <laughs> I remember that phone call and I remember thinking, what? And then I realized prior to training with me, like, don't take this wrong, but his stiff old ass getting down to the bar, yeah. right? That create that created yeah. all the tension he needed, right? Like yeah. just getting to the bar, he was red faced and like, <laughs> okay, I got the yeah. bar, now I can deadlift. And then now he had this extra range of motion. So he had to kind of relearn some things about creating his own tension at the bottom of the deadlift. But that extra range of motion makes him healthier and safer in training the other events and doing other things. It'll also improve his longevity in life, hopefully his sex life, a few other things. You know, hip mobility is important. Yep. And and so for me, like when I when I start addressing clients, yes, like I don't want him to be the next bendy yoga superstar, but I want him to have more than enough mobility for the sport to be in. If you spend all your time at the end range of your mobility, that like the closer you are to the end range of your mobility in a lift, the more likely you are to get injured, right? Yeah. So if you can only barely get to parallel on a squat, right, with and you need 300, 400 pounds to get there, that's not safe in the long run, especially yeah. for guys like us as we get older, right? Yeah. So, you know, we want to be able to go an inch or two below parallel, assuming everything is structurally sound in your knees and hips. Like, so now that your hip replacements happen, like, yeah, like you might be limited yeah. in your depth, but that's, yep. that's an outlier. Like the sure. majority of people that have relatively healthy hips, like you should be able to get into a prayer squat, you know, a squat slightly below parallel and just mm -hmm. sit there for a minute and be comfortable and not feel like things are going to tear. Yep. And I'm a big believer in, you know, mobility is something you use or you lose, you know, sure. and which is why, like, if you look at, you know, Asian cultures who spend a lot of time on the floor, you know, sitting on their heels, there are 70 and 80 year olds that can squat onto their heels and sit there for five, 10, 15, 20 minutes at a time and stand up. Okay. But if you went to any nursing home in America, like, <laughs> most of those people, like they have elevated yeah. toilet seats because they can't get down sure. to the fucking seat. Right. Like, yeah. and so for me, it's like, look, like part of the reason I address mobility is, is injury prevention is, you know, able to achieve better positions and better leverages when you are, training and competing, but also longevity, joint health, right? Like all these things, like the thoracic mobility circuits I give people that, that are, I mean, they seem dumb, you know, little twisting things and things like that, but having a more open shoulder, you know, you're less likely to tear a bicep trying to press or get forearm, you know, tendonitis. I see a lot of people, I had one guy, one master's athlete I was working with had a ton of like bicep tendonitis of forearm because he was so inflexible in his lats that he couldn't get his elbow forward, right. Yeah. To get under a bar. Yeah. So he was reverse curling the bar. Yeah. Right. Like to hold it in place and try to press it as well as like laying back. So we started doing bar hangs, a few upper back things, some stretches, right. Some things to strengthen up the scapular retractors and his upper back while stretching the front of his chest and his lats. Three weeks later, holy shit, he's hitting PRs on push press. Yeah, He's able to press a dumbbell for the first time in forever, right? And he's like, wow, what happened? I'm like, well, your shoulders are healthy. You can, you know, like this is where you were beforehand. And now, you know, you can get all the way over your head. Yeah. And I feel like the majority, like how many guys do you see, you know, they dumbbell press and they look like this, right? Because they can't open themselves up into right. good positions, especially for masters. And so I try to really include in the warm up like three phases. One is, you know, the mobility work. Two is, you know, the activation stuff to kind of claim that mobility to quote um, Kelly Starrett, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and Red then, you know, yeah, so it might be like, you know, oh, you're opening the front of your chest <clears throat> and then you're going to do face pulls, right, to open that up and claim that new mobility before you go press. And then the face pulls also do things to activate your upper back so that it's nice and warm when you're log pressing, right? Yep. So that's the three facets of the warm up that I usually program for people. And let's talk about something too that we've all experienced when we've gone to compete and you've got like a thousand guys and like two warm up stations, right? 
having a standardized warm up, whether it's body weight, calisthenics, bands, whatever. Talk about why that's important and how you can prepare yourself without having the opportunity to get your hands on an actual implement. So you've heard of Pavlov's dog, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the idea being that you, your body and brain become conditioned to certain stimulus sure. and certain, you know, that stimulus is usually a sign that something is going to happen. So for me, one of the things I love about having a standardized warm up that you do every time your body and your brain start to associate that warm up with what's coming next, right? So if every time you deadlift, you do, you know, these three things, right? If you go to a meet, go to a contest, like I, there was, it was nationals in 2017. Yeah, 2017. We were deadlifting. It was 700 pounds for reps off tires. There wasn't a single fucking bar to warm up with, right? So in the back, I did my standardized warm up. I did some bird dogs. I did like, I did the stuff I normally do. I did a couple RDLs with a circus dumbbell that was sitting around and I went out and hit it for I think 12 reps. Right. Yeah. Cause my body was primed and warm from doing the warm up that I'm used to doing too many people go, you know, you heard a lot of people talk about don't change things on contest day. Sure. Right. Well, I agree. Like if you have this, a standardized warm up, this is what you do. These 10, you know, these, three to four things and these stretches and this and this and this, your body becomes accustomed to, Hey, we're doing these stretches. We're doing this warm up. shit. We're going to be deadlifting soon. Right. And you go to a contest and you see guys that like do things way outside their norm and they have a shitty contest. So I try to, you set this up for the future and set this up for contests where you do the same standardized warm up for pressing the same standardized warm up for <coughs> deadlifting and lower body events. Right. So you can do it. You go do it. You may not have a chance to warm up and hit an implement, but sure. your body is still warm. You're loose. You've got some blood flowing and it, <laughs> and it knows it's about to work, right? Because you have done this so many times, right? You've rung the bell, so to speak, like the power house dog and you, your mouth starts watering. You're warm, right? You know, you're going to work after this. And so physiologically it has some positive benefits as well as psychologically. Well, and how often have we seen athletes, right, get so keyed up, so stressed out? I, I got to get in the, you know, I got to get my hands on the lock. I, I got to get my hands on the bar. Like they're so nervous and there's so much angst about not getting in enough warm up sets. Relax, relax. Do your standardized warm up. Maybe touch it once or twice. You're good. Yep. Yep. And that's, I, I, I stress that with a lot of athletes. Like, especially with the first time they're going to nationals or a big contest where, you know, they're not going to get a chance to warm up, yeah. you know? And so we really stress like, okay, here's, you know, you may do, you know, band face pulls and band, you know, presses, right. As part of your warm up yeah. for pressing every day. Well, when you go to a meet, you can take a band, have a partner, hold it, do, you know, do your thoracic mobility stuff, do your band face pulls, do your band presses and go out. I did it for OSG. I've done it for a hundred, like all the contests I've done. Yeah. I'd say only half of them, or maybe not even less than half. Have I had any type of warm equipment at all? Yeah. Right. And, and less than half of those were, 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 were what I would call an adequate warm up. Right. Fuck it. Giants. I got to, pick, before we did farmers at giants, I literally got to pick up a 95 pound pair of farmers and carry them once before I had to go back out. I got to deadlift, you know, it was like a close to 800 pound deadlift for reps. Yeah. I got to pick up 400 pound once backstage yeah. and then ran out. Right. And like, you just don't, you don't always get good warm ups. And so yeah. the standardized warm up, these things, they prime your body to, to get ready to work. And your body knows like, when I do this, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Right. And so you don't necessarily need to hit a bunch of reps on a bar or a bunch of reps on a log before you go yep. because your body's primed and ready to rock. And if you've done the work, it's going to be okay. Yeah. And I think the, the two key takeaways for people who read the book, one, don't skip your warm up, Just, just don't. Right. And then number two, create that standardized warm up. And again, we're not giving you a program in the book, but we're giving you all these examples of things that, you know, that Ken does that, you know, you can do and then plug and play and put it together however it works best for you, right? Address your specific needs, you know, as far as your different, you know, injury history or what's tight, you know, physiologically, your body mechanics, you know, so on and so forth. So it's not- Or saying, even what's tight that day. Yeah, yeah, right? 
yeah. that's like we're giving you the examples. So um, good overview. I think again, there's there's more in the book. So I look forward to getting it out there. We look forward to getting it out there for you guys to all uh, to read and, and learn. And um, that's it. So thanks uh, thanks again for the time, and uh, we'll see you at the next episode.